everybody to this afternoon's interview at Room for Discussion. The banking sector isn't well known for its commitment to social policies or sustainability. After the 2008 global financial crisis, the public's opinion of the banking sector turned sour. But banks are crucial for the way our societies function. What if we had a bank that put their ideals at the center of their mission to bring about this social and sustainable change? Could such a bank become successful in the corporate sector? And how can we be sure that they're actually going to fulfill their promises? Today we will be talking about the perseverance of idealism with the CEO of one of the most sustainable banks in the world, the Triodos Bank. I'm Lois, this is Kasper, and today we will be talking to Jeroen Rijfkema. Please give a warm round of applause. Hello, Mr. Rijfkema, how are you today? I'm fine. I'm happy to see so many people again uh, live. That's uh, a long time. Definitely, well, definitely. It's great that you're here. Thanks for coming to Room for a Discussion this afternoon. Uh, we'd like to kick off this interview uh, with a few dilemmas. Uh, so we'll ask a question. You can choose one of the two options, and then we'll head into the topics we talk about later in this interview. Um, so the first one, Zeist or Zuidas? Zeist. Whose share price will rise more this year, ABN AMRO or Triodos? ABN AMRO. For or against the growth theory? For. Yes or no, nuclear energy? No. Yes or no, biomass? I would say yes. Are you for or against the ECB central bank climate mandate? For. And uh, how did you get to this interview this afternoon? By bike, public transport, or by car? Bike. Well, that's yeah. great. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we'll head into these, uh, <laughs> these answers a little bit during the interview. Um, you've worked at Abian Ambro for more than 30 years before coming to Triodos, uh, most notably in private banking. Uh, one could say it's quite peculiar that you've made this switch from a big commercial bank to this more idealistically oriented, uh, well, smaller bank that is Triodos Bank. What made you switch this career, career path? Well, uh, some things in life uh, also happen co coincidentally. Um, so I left ABN in um, late 2017, and then I thought I will never work with a bank again. Um, I have been now for 30 years in banking, and there are other things in life also as banking. So uh, I started to look around, and I wanted to do something uh, for society and to make a positive impact. And that took me quite some time to find something. And then uh, I was approached by ABN AMRO whether I would like to help to design a um, organization uh, where five banks would cooperate against money laundering. It's called the Transaction Monitoring Netherlands. Um, and uh, I must say it's something which is very close to my heart. Uh, I also look a little bit to the, uh, to, to, to the audience. Uh, the fight against money laundering because um, it is really something which disrupts our society and disrupts individual lives. So um, I was uh, well, happy to be able to uh, help to design it and to build it, and it's now up and running. And during that process, uh, one of the founding fathers was Triodos Bank. Uh, and I came um, uh, across uh, Triodos Bank, and they, come they came across me. And I handed this over um, in uh, December 2020 to a younger generation. Um, I'm of an elderly uh, generation <laughs> and, you know, big tech or big data and fintech. I like to think about it, but there are some people who are just a bit smarter in it than I am. So the younger generation was more familiar with it, so I handed it over. And then I thought, well, um, let's take a look at what's uh, out there again. And before I knew, uh, I was approached by Triodos, and then I thought, yeah, this is the best fit for me, trying to create a positive impact in society uh, and leveraging my uh, experience in the banking industry. And uh, that's why I ended up uh, with Triodos. Because if we compare your, your background in, and your CV with um, former CEO of Triodos and self-proclaimed Marxist, Peter Blom, it always looks kind of peculiar that you're, you're doing the same position. So, so what do you think 
that's exactly um, what, what makes your experience in risk and compliance and, and even the diamond industry um, such a good fit for the three of those characters. Um, sounds like a dilemma. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think by all means, uh, Peter Blom has done something unique, you know, uh, building uh, an organization which started as a movement with a banking license into a European value-based uh, ethical bank. And I think, um, yeah, I can only be extremely uh, impressed what he has done over there. Um, at the same time, I think the, f the bank is now in a phase where we have to transition and transform ourselves um, into, an, uh, yeah, into a different organization with, same th with still the same principles, the same mission, but just the sheer to the size we have, um, we also have to uh, comply with more rules and regulations. Um, the whole banking industry has changed. And I think there I can bring uh, my experience um, of working with, uh, with another organization into this organization and to help people to, uh, to make the transformation. So you already touched shortly on, on Sredos' mission. Could you, in three sentences, explain to us what that mission actually entails? Um, Triodos uh, focuses on um, uh, enabling individuals to live their life in the best manner they can, to create a society where dignity is the leading principle, and to ensure that we um, are yeah, living in the planet in a regenerative manner, so that we uh, do not only take from the planet, but that we also give back, and that we are enabling the next generation to have a comparable life on this planet as, um, as we have. And what exact structures within the company kind of ensure that you keep to this mission? That's a good question. I think one of the, um, the, the key uh, differentiating factors is that we look at all the things we do um, from an impact, a risk, and a return perspective. So all the things we finance, all the activities we uh, embark upon have to create a positive impact. If it does not create a positive impact, we will not be interested. We also have three areas where we focus upon. Um, uh, climate and energy, nature, food, biodiversity, and social inclusion. There might be other projects which are very attractive and maybe from a banking perspective, uh, very uh, remunerative, but then we will not enter into them because they don't create positive impact and they are not in our three focus areas. And last but not least, we have quite an, um, yeah, well-defined, and I would re uh, recommend you all to go to the website, mm -hmm. uh, site with, uh, say, minimum standards. So there are a number of industries where we will not enter into. So we will not enter into, um, uh, say, fossil uh, fuel industry. We will not be in the gambling industry. We will not be in pornography. We will not be in weapon industry. In all these kind of uh, intensive uh, agriculture, we just don't do it. Even if you can make a lot of money in it, we will not enter into it. And um, which part of kind of your structure ensures that your stakeholders don't influence your decisions on your kind of investment endeavors? The founders of the bank created in um, sorry, uh, 1980, the bank now exists um, 41 years, 42 years, uh, a structure where there was a separation between capital and the bank. So um, we have a, um, a deposit receipt system and the voting on um, uh, the, uh, say the underlying shares are being uh, concentrated with a foundation. And the foundation is a full 100% uh, shareholder and they have the obligation to look at their, w when, when they vote, at the interest of the certificate holders, um, the mission, to protect the mission, and uh, the interest of the bank. So this is the SAS, right? This is SAS, yeah. Yes. And therefore there's a um, distinction between um, uh, the capital suppliers of the bank and um, the, um, say the, the shareholder who takes into account the interest of the capital suppliers but also of the bank and the protection of the mission. Because over the past uh, months and years we often see in the news these activist uh, shareholders uh, in many different companies Aren't you dealing with activists, well, depository receipt holders sometimes who have the power to change the mission of Triodos? No, because also that was, um, I think, in the original setup very well arranged. Um, 
every uh, certificate holder can have uh, uh, at maximum, um, uh, say, 1,000 um, uh, votes. You might think, well, but you just said he doesn't have votes. Well, there are a number of areas where the certificate holder can have votes. For instance, if you would change the articles of administration or some other specific well-defined things. But even if you had to have, uh, say, 7% of the share uh, of the certificates, you can have only 1,000 votes at maximum. So it's uh, limited. Uh, and as I said, on many topics, um, the certificate holders don't have a specific vote. But that translates to 10% holding in the company, right? Well, that's another, um, uh, that's another um, say, um, standard. You can never have more than 10% of all the certificates. But even if you would have, say, 9% or 10%, you still have uh, 1,000 votes. And to put things in perspective, there are 14.4 million certificates and there are 43,500 certificate holders. So 1,000 votes, when you have, say, 400,000 certificates, or you might even have 1 million certificates, is, um, well, at least protecting us um, until now against activist uh, forces. You, you mentioned earlier um, that you're growing in size, and that's also one of uh, the assets why, why you are now in charge of Triodos Bank. Um, is it not a good idea to lower these ownership constraints in order to attract more investment and a broader investment base in this depository receipt system in order to sustain and manage yourself in this growing size? Well, it, it, it's a good question. It's also one of the discussions, you know, uh, we have now sometimes with shareholders that, listen, um, you want to be a transparent bank, you want to be a sustainable bank. We talk about ESG, um, but, you know, when you're talking about governance, you know, how modern is it if you have certain kind of restrictions and that you don't give one certificate one vote. So, um, yeah, it's an interesting discussion. Last year, uh, Triels Bank also announced that you were going to issue green bonds and uh, 250 million euros worth of green bonds uh, from which the proceeds will go to green projects. Um, I've read the perspectives, as many investors uh, hopefully do, uh, the booklet which gives you information about where the money goes to, <laughs> and, uh, the legal rights, etc. He's, he's well prepared. <laughs> um, but what I found very interesting when reading the prospectus is that Fidel's Bank gives no assurance to whether these these funds will actually go uh, towards green projects defined such as by the, the EU Green Taxonomy, for example. Um, well, I think we are obliged to do so um, because we, uh, yeah, otherwise we could not claim the. Um, the title green bond um, so it will only go to um, say uh, sustainable projects and that is also going to be measured uh, but and we also have to report on it didn't you say that the legal framework for green bonds was is still relatively vague at least in this yeah. report we've read <laughs> yeah but i think w in a way you can of course debate all these frameworks and it's also things which are in development uh, we have stated and we will also ensure that we will allocate it to green projects um, because we think it is important to make this distinction between normal bonds and green bonds. But aren't we then just relying on kind of the good world word of triodos? Yes. Because. But y we, we also know that there will be a moment when we will be tested on that. So, you know, we will be scrutinized and we should be scrutinized. Um, so I think we have no margin ourselves to, um, yeah, to be uh, a little bit fuzzy about it. But then this is kind of difficult because the DR system doesn't really allow for this, this market monitoring because you can only trade your DR with the bank itself. Don't you think that kind of this scrutinization won't really affect you as much because there's just no monitoring from like an open stock market, for example? There's no pricing mechanism, you would say. Yeah, yeah but it's interesting to, uh, to have the philosophy that only shareholders are the controlling factor in life. Uh, I am not so sure whether that is the right statement. You know, we also have, uh, uh, thank God, critical media who follow uh, organizations. We can have, um, if you want, outside analysts who can follow you. And of course, we have all kinds of um, regulatory bodies. Um, well, we had all about the, uh, the, the regulators, ECB, the, the DNB. And of course, you have uh, uh, metrics by uh, the, the SBTI standards, other parties who will measure your performance. So um, let's not get um, yeah, drifted away by the fact that only shareholders will control and uh, 
check the company. So let's move on to kind of the current situation that we're facing right now um, with the DRs. Um, for over a year, more than 40,000 DR holders have been unable to kind of access the capital in their DRs. Yeah. Um, meanwhile, the current estimated value of the DRs has decreased from 84 euros to 59 euros. How, how did this happen? Um, this is going to be a long story, and I hope it's not going to be boring for all of you. Um, but yeah, a, a she, short summary. But, but <laughs> she asked the question, so I just follow <laughs> the question. Um, well, we have this system where um, you know you could buy uh, certificates of uh, the bank, uh, and then the bank would um, uh, hand over hand out the certificate, and you could uh, sell the certificate. There was a trading facility, and the only trading party uh, is the bank. Um, due to uh, prudential regulations, um, we are allowed to have a trading or a market-making facility of 36 million. The 36 million is 3% of the capital. Uh, and it's, of course, done uh, in order to ensure that uh, the bank, under all circumstances, will have a financial stable position. Because if you would have more, then basically you would reduce the capital of the bank. So 3%, 36 million, that worked well for 40 years. Um, and actually the buffer was never fully utilized. Then we came into the corona time where you saw that stock markets went down and there was an yeah, unexpected oversupply of uh, certificates. We could not handle that within the 36 million, so we had to uh, suspend the trade. I think that has shocked quite a number of people because they never anticipated that that situation could happen, although it's been written down in the prospectus. But I think then you also see fact of life that many people get these prospectuses, but they do not all read them into detail. Um, so we suspended it. Then we uh, restarted the trade in um, October 2020. But basically, the system was disturbed. And um, we had to suspend again in January this year, or last year, 2021. And basically, um, yeah, since then, the trade has been suspended. And we have now been looking at um, uh, other solutions. And one of the key characteristics uh, of the former system was that you would always be able to sell against intrinsic value. So there was no um, uh, stabilizing factor with variable pricing. So if you would have a lot of supply, you would have a lower price. And if you would have a lot of demand, you would have a higher price. Uh, here you would always get the intrinsic value. Well, that system uh, went, uh, went sour. And now we will have to change to a system based on variable pricing where supply and demand will find an equilibrium at a certain level. So this is, this is part of the solution, yeah. basically, because there is kind of a big, I guess, um, wave in, in criticism from your DR holders, even starting the organization Triodom, kind of urging you to merge and maybe yeah. even compromise. So could you elaborate a little bit more on, on the way to solve this problem or kind of how you are willing to lend a hand to these you know, relatively angry <laughs> the all holders currently. Yeah, can I just want to say one more thing about the price? Eh? So Definitely, the price was yeah. always intrinsic and has always gone up because the bank has always been profitable and, uh, yeah, you know, grew the, uh, the capital. If you look at valuation of banks, uh, most banks, especially in Western Europe, are all um, valued at this moment below intrinsic value. Uh, so on average, uh, if you look at the uh, European um, uh, Euro stocks index is now around 0 0.67, 0 0.68 in valuation. Um, uh, ING is slightly above, ABN Emirates is slightly below, but you know, it depends per bank uh, that investors are willing to pay less than the intrinsic value. According to Dutch law, we are obliged, if the, if the stock is being suspended, to give the right economic value to the tax authorities by year end. And that's why we said, well, we will apply an administrative discount of 30% because we deem that the actual value when you trade on a variable price will be lower than the intrinsic value. So that's why we came up with the 59. Now, your question, how are you going to deal with it? Uh, that's, of course, um, the big secret for today because I will have a meeting, four meetings with my DR holders next week. So if you allow me, I'm not going to tell too much about it at this moment. Um, but yeah. I think it is important to stress what is not changing. The mission of the bank is not changing. Um, the financial performance of the bank is not changing. I cannot disclose it at this moment, but we will publish our results on the 17th of uh, March. 
But last Friday, Fitch, which is an official rating uh, agency, reconfirmed the rating of Trios Bank, triple B, uh, stable outlook. outlook. And um, the rights of the DR holders are, is, are also not changing. The only thing which is changing, and which is quite important, of course, fund fundamental, is um, the price mechanism from a fixed price based on intrinsic value to a variable price. And that is, of course, very unpleasant uh, if you want to sell now. If you don't want to sell now and you want to sell in 10 years from now, I can't predict what the price is 10 years from now, your rights remain the same, but on paper it has an effect. And that, of course, has also psychological value, so I'm not going to downplay it. But I also would like to stress that the mission of the bank, and that's the reason why all these investors invested in Trios, the mission of the bank remains unchanged. As part of the And solution. that's, by the way, also what I will say next time, because before you know, I am being drawn into to become a main street bank, you know, a mainstream bank, and I am not yeah. a mainstream bank, you know. We are a bank with a purpose, uh, who wants to have a positive impact on society. Um, as part of one of the announced possible solutions, um, and also to stabilize the price at what we just talked about, um, the bank has announced that it will, for around 15 million euros, 14 and a half million euros, uh, buy back shares from the market using the, the last of their capacity under the 3% rule. Um, that was about three times the 2020 profit. Is Triodom right in saying that they uh, should merge maybe with a different bank or can you actually give the DR receipt holders a, a solution financially? Um, you have seen the half year financials uh, of 2021. You have seen that Triodos uh, had a good solid first half year 2021. I am just not allowed to make any statements about the, the full year 2021. But uh, over the first half, we reported a profit, net profit of 27.8 million. I think 2020 was for many companies a unique year due to uh, Corona um, and also with the perceived uh, credit losses we were th at that time expecting. I think we have all seen that thanks to the support of governments and the recuperation of economy in um, 2000, uh, late 2020, early 2021, uh, that many of these loan losses will not occur and therefore you see with all banks that there's a release of uh, provisions which have been taken in 2020. So the first half of 2021 uh, presented solid results. Um, the fact that we use now this 14.4 is actually the remaining room we did not use under the buffer and I thought we should um, give that back to our uh, DR holders at this moment uh, and that's what we're going to do. Um, the discussion uh, about Triodom, um, yeah, I think that um, uh, it's important to stress what will not change and we should not change our commitment to the mission and we should safeguard the mission. Yeah. Um, the mission you talk about, that's the mission for the, the, the depositor receipt holder that he, he or she invests in. What is actually your ideal depositor receipt holder? Who is the Triodos DR holder? You. The young generation? I think, well, I think the young generation, but also people who want to make a positive impact by conscious use of their money. Um, and that's also what we say, we create double uh, return. We create a decent financial return uh, over time, 3.3% on average, you know, so it's not the highest return, but you know, it's a decent return. But we create also positive impact on society, be it uh, financing, um, solar energy, wind energy, um, affordable housing, investing in um, uh, projects for regenerative um, uh, agriculture, these kind of things we do. And um, yeah, I think that is, there's a world out there of people uh, wanting to invest over there. And I think it's also important, we now talk a lot about the DR holders, but let's not forget about the 750,000 clients we have. Uh, still the growing number of savings we get from clients, but also the growing amounts people want to invest in the activities of Trido's investment management, where they want to invest in all kinds of investment funds, uh, ranging from the Trido's Green Fund, uh, more than one billion invested in green projects uh, all over Europe, but also the Fair Share Fund or the Microfinance Fund, where 
we really are able to touch lives of people and to create positive impact. Yeah, because I, I do want to return back to, to the very beginning of this conversation when you talked about size and the, the necessity to grow. And I think if Three Rolls really wants to make an impact, um, it needs to be bigger than it is now. I mean, if you compare uh, size-wise uh, to, to the amount of what you can do with your money and um, how many sustainable projects you can undertake, doesn't Triodos really need to diversify its its base of, of investment investors um, and try to get more people than just maybe the, the young people who have like one of those green classes? Uh, well, shouldn't you be reaching out to institutional investors more or uh, other investment banks or larger institutions? Well, we, we do have a number of institutional investors um, and I think in the transition to the new uh, trading system where we will um, go to variable pricing, we definitely will also welcome uh, institutional investors, definitely. Mm -hmm. But I also would like to really remain attractive for our clients who want to invest uh, in the DRs um, and also to make it um, yeah, as easy as possible, accessible for everyone who wants to uh, use uh, his or her money in a conscious manner and not only go into the uh, institutional manner. So I really would like to, uh, to balance them well. So it's not just your clientele or your DR holders that really showcase your, your mission, it's also your investments itself. And we yep. already heard of some of the examples. But a lot of the investments that you openly kind of market um, are micro loans, for example. Mm -hmm. So these are relatively safe um, loans, but, but are not really known for being that lucrative. I mean, we, we, we took a look at some of them and we found, for example, an anthroposophic daycare here in Amsterdam. And we were wondering, how does Triodos make enough money with these micro loans and their investments to actually be attractive for the R holders and, and grow? Yeah, well, of course, I could have expected when we are in an economic um, environment, you know, that we are challenging on a return. But I would challenge you, you know, um, uh, open up for a paradigm shift. You know, it is not only about financial return. It's also about, you know, investing in your future. You know, is it only about, you know, short term financial gain? Or is it also about what kind of society do we want to build with each other? I would um, agree and, that and, and, and do we want to invest in um, a sustainable environment? You know, in our free discussion, we also said, you know, I feel in a certain way also responsible for your future. You know, what is happening with the biodiversity in this country? You know, we have great um, agricultural um, uh, returns, you know. We are um, one of the largest, if not the largest, agricultural export company in the, in the in, uh, country in the world. But at what cost? You know, the biodiversity in this country is being degenerated in an enormous uh, speed. But so uh, is it then only in investing um, <laughs> in projects which will generate more financial return? Or is it also investing in projects where you have a decent return on financial terms? but you have a huge ecological or societal return. And that's what we stand for. So it's not only about a double digit financial return, it's about double digit overall return. But I mean, I think we could all agree that these, these kind of changes that you're looking for are super, super important, but that at the end of the day, the Triodos Bank, it's not a government. It works in, in a, in a for-profit kind of structure and in order for this paradigm shift to become larger than it already is, you'll have to make more profit and grow. So, so do you still think that these, these investments that you're making will be sustainable in order to actually push through that paradigm shift? I think so, I think so. And I think, um, of course, we also do agree that we have to um, uh, rebalance our uh, financial uh, requirements uh, and, and bring them higher up compared to our impact. Eh? So also when I started, I said, well, we now have a return of three to 5% on, uh, on equity. I want to move from four to six. Well, that doesn't sound that spectacular if you compare it to uh, the main street banks, but for three euros, it's quite a change. And I said, you know, in cost income ratio, we are now above 80%. We should move to the 75 to 70. That's quite a change, um, but it's still way above in terms of cost income ratio, uh, some of the larger banks, or in terms of return on equity, 
is significantly lower than some of the other banks who are at 10 to or 13 percent, or ABN AMRO is at uh, 8 to 10 percent. Yeah, I think for us that is good enough, and um, I think we will find an um, investor base, but also client base which is feeling comfortable with that. Because those those metrics is what I would would argue actually, and of course you've only been working at Fields for not too long now, but uh, return on assets, return on equity, uh, these are all declining trends uh, over the past years, and of course that started before you were chairing Fields. Um, but what used to we have of a bank that uh, will go bankrupt, um, but is trying to invest in great projects in the long run. Um, let, let's, let's clarify one thing. There is no way, um, we're not even close, you know, about talking words of bankruptcy, you know. Uh, and in a bank, that's a very, very sensitive statement. So let's stay away from that because then I really get nervous. Um, you know, as I said, we were just rated triple B, yep. stable outlook. To be very clear, it's investment grade. Um, and we just presented uh, an, um, a profit over the first half of 2021 of 27.8 million. So, and we have a capital ratio of well above uh, 18%. Yeah. So I think in that sense, you know, we're, we're a solid financial institution. But of course, yeah, you can make more profit. And um, we have stated that, you know, we want to have a decent profit um, next to a lot of societal impact. And there are other banks uh, which make much more profit. Um, but yeah, um, well, I'm not going to compare uh, other colleagues with us, but I think um, we do much better on societal impact. Yeah. How dependent do you think the Triodos is um, on kind of big government intervention. So for example, there's like this very hip new rise in, in sustainable projects that have to do with climate change because there's also a lot of money coming from the EU and, and different nations towards these projects. Don't you think that if, you know, all of a sudden big government decides like, no, we're not interested in that anymore, that you really have to hammer down on kind of the goodwill of the people? No, because I think, um, um, we have been working like this for 40 years. Uh, we grew from a very small organization to an organization which is now in five countries, um, with, as I said, more than 750,000 clients. And there are a lot of people who are really engaged and inspired uh, and energized by creating this positive impact. And it's not only about, say, being a green bank, so only about uh, climate and, um, and, 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 and uh, energy, but it's also the cultural sector. You know, we uh, made an arrangement with the European um, community to have 200 million uh, of um, uh, money to invest and to, uh, to lend to uh, the, uh, the cultural sector. And I think there will always be room for it. Um, and one of your dilemmas was uh, growth or degrowth. Um, I think that we can also really uh, live very well with, um, you know, uh, say decent growth, but we don't need that big of uh, growth, no. So I think we would like to open the floor uh, for audience questions, actually. Good. So if anyone, or if you have maybe a question for our audience as well. Do um, we have a working mic? Yeah. I think so. Um, sir in the second row, in blue. Um, actually, I've got a question for the interviewers first. Are you planning on, I don't want to derail your interview plan, but are you going to ask about degrowth in the rest of the interview? Because if you're not, then I'd like to ask a question on degrowth. Go for it. Go for okay, it, yeah. Um, yeah, so what is, your, what is your exact position on degrowth then? Because at the start you said you were for it, but then just now you said we could have a little bit of growth, but we don't need you know, a lot of growth. So where, where do you exactly stand on, on degrowth? Well, when the dilemma was that, you know, I don't think that you, um, you need growth only to get things better. You can also make other choices. Um, um, and in terms of um, running a company, uh, it's not only to be bigger, 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 uh, and then uh, have to, uh, to solve all the problems. You know, I could also live with a situation where there is hardly any growth, and if I have to uh, decrease on a number of areas, 
you know, I could also consider that. So it's not that uh, we are now active in five countries, that I am dreaming that in, um, in five years from now I have to be in ten countries. You know, I can also uh, create influence and impact, and it's all about impact, in, uh, say, for instance, partnerships. Uh, one of the things we, uh, we did as Triros is to establish in 2010 um, the Global Alliance for Banking on Values. So we have now an association with um, three, I'd say two banks in Germany, uh, banks in the UK, in uh, Scandinavia, but also in uh, the United States, in other countries, where we all have the same principles and where we try to strengthen each other, but I don't have to be there myself. So growth is not the, uh, the mantra which makes everything better. You, I think you can also uh, achieve impact in different ways. And no. it, but is, sorry, is that um, specifically for you at Triodos, or is that your position on kind of societies and economies as a whole? Is that no, I think it's now for me specifically on, um, uh, say, on Triodos, but if you think about, say, economic growth, also there, I think, yeah, um, growth in itself is not the mantra we should uh, pursue under all circumstances, especially not when it's coming at a cost of... Um, um, say, uh, exploiting our planet and uh, basically taking away uh, future uh, possibilities of living in dignity in society. We do one more question? Yeah, does anyone else have a question? Come in boy in purple. Yeah. <laughs> so you said at the beginning that you will never enter into oil. Um, and I found that quite an interesting statement because um, a lot of projections say that we'll still be relying on oil for you know, a great deal by 2050. Um, and I also see a lot of technologies these days which are trying to revolutionize the climate impact that is uh, made by uh, energy generation from oil. For example, you have carbon sequestration where um, you know, in uh, energy generation you can, instead of releasing the carbon into the climate, put it into the ground. Uh, and I was wondering if your commitment to not investing into oil goes that far, or if you're willing to entertain those technologies as well, and if not, why? Well, I think it's a good question, you know. Um, I think one of the things I really like uh, with Triodos is that, you know, we take uh, a stance, so we say certain things we just don't do. Um, that doesn't mean that everything which would happen in that area uh, is, um, uh, you know, uh, not, um, it could not be positive, but we just don't do it. Um, because otherwise you get also in endless discussions, you know, yes this, no that. Um, but for instance, uh, we have made a statement uh, as one to zero. We want to be climate neutral in 2035. Mind you, in 2035, most of the other players in the financial sector talk about 2050 and then they only talk about their uh, lending portfolio. We include also our investment portfolio. So when we are investing on stock listed um, uh, titles, there are definitely companies who need uh, oil, uh, for instance, to do certain things. We will offset that with sequestration and other area uh, activities in the next 14 years. That, by the way, can keep me out of my sleep because we have only 14 years to go to really move towards a net zero portfolio. Um, but we ourselves will not finance um, uh, projects in the uh, fossil industry. Thank you so much for, for your questions. If we have time, we'll come back to them at the end as well. Just um, one, one more question with that uh, gentleman. Okay, yeah. Yeah, we can do one question. Uh, a few days ago, the statistical office reported a, a, a substantial increase of companies in the Netherlands. Not because of so much new companies, but because of existing companies that didn't stop due to the government support. Co uh, <coughs> these are the living dead, the zombies. How do you t treat them? Oh. Uh, that, that assumes that I would be aware of um, the, these kind of companies in our client portfolio. In all honesty, uh, I am not. I'm, I'm sorry about that. I uh, I have not looked into that. Um, I I think that the um, 
uh, say the support measures of the government um, have helped us a lot to get through this uh, crisis uh, uh, caused by uh, by corona uh, will it mean that uh, certain companies are still active which in a normal economic cycle would not have been active yeah I also read about it that is something which uh, the future will prove um, we feel very comfortable with our loan portfolio uh, and I think if you see uh, our track record we also have a uh, as we call it a low risk loan portfolio so I feel comfortable uh, with that but yeah how that will evolve in the coming time I, I don't know yes let's see thank you okay we'd like to return to um our kind of questions on, on Triodos' ideals and their investments and their growth. Um, imagine a situation in which the Triodos Bank has to either, so very hypothetically, we already established that the Triodos is in a very safe space, but have to make a decision between investing in lucrative but very ethically questionable nuclear energy investment or close their doors. What decision would you make as CEO? Well, I like dilemmas, but they have to be a little bit realistic. <laughs> um, but um, I think the price to squander the, uh, the, uh, the ideals and the mission of Triodos uh, would, would, would be too high. So I think um, the only reason for Triodos to be as unique as it is, is to stay loyal and committed to its, um, uh, yeah, to its values and to its ideals. And um, we should not squander them. And um, a little bit like going bankrupt or closing doors, I find that a little bit too extreme. But if you would say, well, um, uh, would you forego growth or would you uh, take other decisions in order to stay loyal to your, um, to your values and your mission, yes. yes. And on the other side of the coin, so would you make concessions to certain part of your missions? Because life is of course not as black as white as and white as closing doors or staying true to your ideals. But would you make concessions to your ideals in order to be able to grow to a size of the ING and really push that paradigm shift through? No, no, I, no, I think then, um, I think you really are um, yeah, squandering your uh, uniqueness as um, um, as Trios Bank, and I think also um, for us, the driving force is positive impact, um, and we talk about um, finance change and change finance. I think in that sense we also play. Uh, much more about our um, relative weight um, because we have made these real choices. So, for instance, when we had the climate, the energy climate um, uh, agreement in the Netherlands, in the financial sector, we played an important role in that. And I think we could also play that role that was uh, agreed upon in 2018, 2019, because our position is also not being disputed by the other one. You know, um, no one sees that we, uh, or feels, that we just take the stance, um, um, you know, um, easily. Everyone knows that we are really, um, uh, yeah, the, you know, it's in our DNA. And if we would let that go, I think we, um, yeah, we uh, we lose our um, uh, our convincing power, and I think that would not be good for us, but also not for the sector. Yeah. So um, in that sense. Um, we have no ambition to become a Main Street bank. We want to be this, um, yeah, uh, this rebel, this change agent, um, this uh, party who, uh, in a way, uh, all also creates a uh, wake-up call. Sort of anarchist in the banking culture. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, anarchist, but you know, uh, <laughs> and it's, it, it's a good word. It's also, you know, we we embrace this activism, and I think it is important. And you can be activist in a very constructive manner. But we want to also stimulate, um, um, say, uh, other parties in the financial sector to, uh, to rethink. Mm. And the good news is it does work. So when we signed this, um, this, this letter, which I also signed in a few Dutch newspapers um, against um, 
uh, including uh, gas and uh, uh, nuclear energy in the taxonomy. You know, also ASN Bank was signing up, also ASR was signing up, also other parties. And then some people say, yeah, but you know, if you are signing up with ASN, what makes you uh, special? No, welcome the others. Let's really welcome that we are not the only one, uh, but that also others are teaming up with us because we really also want to influence the system. Because we, we, we talked earlier about um, maybe not being uh, profitable enough to continue, but I think that's quite a safe, uh, space, safe uh, space at Triodos. But however, uh, is Triodos committed enough to its ideals? And if you look at the reports that we can read, unfortunately not the one for 2021 yet, um, you do see that the triple bottom line assets, so those that uh, well most accurately portray if a bank is doing acting sustainably, uh, people plan at profit uh, investments, is steadily decreasing uh, over the past years as well. So what did you say that Triodos is investing less and less and less into their committed goals? Um, I, I don't have the uh, annual account, uh, account of 2020 completely in my head at this <laughs> moment, but I am not aware that it's, it's changing. Um, Between 2016 and 2020, it went from 77 to 74%, and those are marginal changes, of course, but it is your commitment to, to your ideals. And 77% of what is it? Um, well, the triple bottom line assets of your total assets. So those are those that are in people, planet, profit, uh, well, uh, definitely I have to uh, look that up tonight <laughs> and, and see what you're referring to because I'm now, um, yeah, I, I don't have the answer about that. But okay. uh, if that's the case, it's definitely not a, um, a well thought through policy. Um, um, so, um, so uh, curious to see what, it, what the number is going to be yeah. in the 2021 but report. Rest assured, I will try to do my best yeah. to reverse that trend. <laughs> yeah, great. <laughs> But the, the, the triple bottom line assets are not uh, the only thing that can occur to us as some sort of a um, concession might be a big word, but uh, the multilateral trading facility that you um, became public with um, in order as a solution to the current DR problem also seems to be some sort of concession or, or tweaking of the structures that are in place to actually ensure that you stick to those ideals and that mission. Well, um, yeah, and of course, sometimes reality is, um, uh, yeah, you know, forcing you to uh, to make adjustments. Um, I don't see it as um, a concession. I see it as um, living up to reality. Uh, why don't I see it as a concession? Because the structure remains the same. We will move to trading these certificates as a uh, semi-public uh, environment, not at the stock exchange uh, where you cannot control it, but at the semi-public environment, I still will know who are my DR holders. They are still registered. It's not anonymous. I still know um, that Casper and Lois are inv inv investing in it, and it's not an anonymous investor who just puts in money and maybe sells it tomorrow. You know, it's, 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 it's really still uh, uh, yeah, uh, nurturing the community. Uh, secondly, um, the voting rights still remain with uh, the SAAD, uh, and this, the mission does not change. But yeah, given the fact that uh, the current system has um, yeah, uh, turned sour, and there are people who want to trade the certificates, and I cannot cater for that anymore, of course, as a prudent um, uh, leader of such an organization, I have to find other ways to enable people to trade. And I regret that it will be at a lower price, um, at least as we can see it at this moment. Um, but at least I will, for the people who want to trade, create a possibility again to trade. You said this is not really a concession, but you did point to it being um, a change you make in order to kind of fit within the reality of the banking sector. And this is, I think, the paradox that we walk in kind of throughout this conversation is the idealism of the bank, but also the reality, sometimes harsh reality of the financial world. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think that is uh, what you see, that um, uh, it, it requires a lot of um, effort and a lot of determination to stay as much as possible close to your ideals. And we are very close to the ideals of um, 
um, you know, minimum standards, certain sectors we don't want to finance, we don't want to finance nuclear industry, we don't want to finance uh, weapons, um, uh, gambling. Um, we uh, st stay loyal to our, um, uh, uh, to our mission. But yeah, at a certain area, um, you know, for instance, with the DDRs, uh, we cannot stay loyal to the system which was installed 40 years ago, where you would always be able to trade against intrinsic value. Yeah, that we have to forego. Uh, and there I concur. Does, does uh, your background coming from a, a very different mission, uh, different bank with a different mission, does that change um, how these discussions go in the boardroom? And does it change the direction of the bank? Does it make you more versatile, but also maybe less committed? Or does that not have an influence? No, definitely not less committed. Um, I think that um, there's always an advantage uh, for a new CEO entering in. You bring in new eyes in the boardroom. Um, and of course, I, yeah, I, I can have a, a, a fresh look at reality because I am well part of the future and I was not part of the past. Um, so uh, when I came um, and I saw that we were, um, yeah, in a way um, looking at this um, uh, this question on the table uh, of how to um, reopen trade and how to reestablish tradeability, um, I gave myself and uh, and my team uh, say till ye year end. So um, at, since the end of uh, May, we had seven months to come up with a solution. And after seven months, we had to have a solution. And um, yeah, in that sense, I think um, uh, I am responsible for the past, but I was not part of the past. And I think in that sense, I was a bit, a little bit more in an advantage to come in uh, with fresh eyes from outside. And of course, what I brought in is that I said, well, if you see some of the paradigm shifts, um, yeah, we really have to beef up um, our uh, financial um, uh, yeah, matrices. We have to become a little bit more profitable and we have to li uh, be a little bit more attractive for our investors. Yeah. So let's look towards the future. What can we expect from, from Triodos in 2030? Well, first and foremost, that we will celebrate our 50th anniversary. So um, <laughs> be part of it. Um, 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 so I think that's it. Uh, I hope then that by then um, we have really um, set clear uh, guidance on how we will become uh, net zero in 2035 and that we have also inspired the industry and that we have taken people along with us. I do hope that we have also then um, created real traction in um, say uh, regenerative uh, projects uh, also in terms of uh, biodiversity. And um, yeah, I presume that then we are still a uh, very stable, solid bank of a comparable size. It doesn't have to be bigger, it might even be a bit uh, smaller with a uh, strong um, uh, DR holder base uh, supported by people who buy into the mission and supported by clients who buy into the mission and that we create uh, even more impact than we do nowadays. And looking a bit farther into the future, do you think that the new norm will become banks like Triodos? Do you think that the anarchist bank with the ideals will become what we will maybe experience when we grow old? Well, I do hope that we will be able to contribute to um, influence the sector for the better. Um, I think it's important, that's also why we uh, stress the conscious use of money Money is at the basis of a lot of um, change in our society. Uh, and unfortunately, that's the way it is. So I do hope that we will, in a way, contaminate for the positive other financial uh, institutions that they also will embrace the use of money for the positive and that they will shift funds much more to regenerative uh, projects, to the economic reset, to investing in biodiversity, to move away from industrialized agricultural, uh, that they will move much more to sustainable energy and that they will move much more towards uh, inclusive uh, projects, including housing in our society. Um, and if that means that there are more banks like Triodos, great. But if you really want to create influence, we have to make sure that we, may, we remain true to our um, 
uh, roots and to our values, and that we really influence the financial industry, so that we also stop with, um, you know, um, contaminating the taxonomy, that we stop with greenwashing, and that we really offer people to make a choice how to move, the, how to make uh, their money uh, conscious and yeah. in, in, in use. Because this this rhetoric and these types of uh, ambitions, we also hope to hear from many banks in the future. Um, do you think there's a danger that many banks will act like this on the front, but then in the back and in their investments, not really put through the change and be greenwashed in a way? Do you see that as a danger? Yeah, I, I do hope, by the way, Casper, uh, it's not rhetoric. You know, I do hope it's a real felt. Um, but um, to the defense also of my colleagues, um, it's not only a change in the financial industry, it's yeah. also a change in our society, you know. Um, we had this interesting debate about financial return, and I'm also going to challenge you as the younger generation, you know, look beyond only short-term financial returns. Also look at what are we going to do with your money. And then still you may challenge us that we uh, generate a decent return. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, we also have to... Um, see that if you invest in a green fund, uh, like we have, uh, yeah, then you have a return of 2.3, 2 2.5, 3%. 2 .3%. It is impossible when you invest in green projects to have double digit um, uh, returns, which you might have if you uh, invest in crypto or in high tech. Yeah, you know, I really hope to convince people that it is worthwhile to look at the total return also the societal return, and not only at the financial return in short term. But it's not about the only the financial industry. It's also about us, consumers, investors, what do we do with our money? And I will advocate the conscious use of money. To have a more holistic view. Of yes, and of a long-term view. Yeah. You know, Not only yeah. in the next 6 or 12 or 18 months, but in the next 6, 12 yeah. or 18 years. Yeah, yeah. Because... Um, you touched on it briefly, the, the taxonomy and not poisoning it. What is your view on that? And do you think that will push through, the, through this change or does it need to really come from the sector itself like you do? I think it has to come from the sector, but I think it also needs society to move and the politicians. And I really regret that we are now in this political consensus driven uh, uh, discussion uh, of uh, contaminating the, uh, the taxonomy. Then better create a third one, you know, create a, you know, an, an, an in-between one or a grey one, but also have a real one and offer people uh, an, uh, a choice. And people who want to move, uh, use their money consciously, then they know I really invest in green activities and not in contaminated uh, activities. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to sit here and, and answer our questions. I think we can still take a brief moment to open up the floor yet again. For yeah, I, I hope questions. that you have questions. Um. Anyone has a question? The sir in the brown jacket? I don't know where our... Uh, oh, she's I have, <laughs> she's I have all up. time for the questions, so uh, also afterwards. Over uh, there. But it's important. Thanks a lot for, uh, for the interview. What I was really curious about, what you hear very often, is that one of the key challenges when you work with, say, social return on investment is the fact that because of the ambiguity of many social and sustainable projects, it's really difficult to, um, let's say, make it generalizable between all, the, all these different projects. How do you work with that ambiguity within your bank? Well, of course, we try to assess it as good as we can. Um, and by having a good constant dialogue with your clients, you also try to influence it. But um, I think we also have to be re realistic that sometimes projects turn out differently than you envisaged. Um, because ultimately, we are financing clients or we are investing in clients. We are not running their show. Um, in another interview, I said... Um, Cynicism is the um, main uh, blockade to, um, to, to, to change. Um, and we should be critical with each other. 
to see uh, whether things work out well, and if they don't work out, we have to address it and to try to, um, uh, to change it. But we should also not be hindered by the things which sometimes don't turn out well um, to pursue further innovation, further uh, change, and uh, further um, yeah, uh, creating of impact. And um, I would encourage everyone to uh, avoid that cynicism, but at the same time also remain critical on the thi things which go wrong. And uh, sometimes things do go wrong. Um, um, you know, we also have to discuss uh, with our clients uh, how can we help them to make the move to its uh, net zero. Uh, I won't rule out that we finance certain clients in, uh, in certain sectors where we feel it fits within our um, uh, social inclusion structure. So think about um, uh, elderly care, home, uh, home setups or cultural sector or other uh, education projects whereas maybe on um, a climate and energy, they are not so contributing as we would like them to do. Then, yeah, you can say, well, you know, they don't live up to the full mission of Triodos. Well, then we have to engage into uh, a discussion with them. How can we help them to also become more sustainable on the um, uh, climate and energy uh, domain? Um, but let's not um, then, because they are not active in that uh, situation, not help them in the whole transition. Also in the mortgage side now, we are financing clients who want to um, yeah, make their house uh, more sustainable. Um, I think the worst thing we could do is to only look at clients who have already the house fully sustainable because then we are not part of the transition. And I think one of the things we have to do is to ensure that there will be a just transition and that everyone can participate in the transition. But in order to enable people to participate in the transition, we also have to finance them. And there will be dilemmas. Um, but let's have that discussion about the dilemmas and see how we can make the transition help uh, and to accomplish together. Thank you. Anyone else you would like to ask a question? Um, I was curious, I think many more banks are like starting to also have like um, sustainable investment branches in that yep. sense, right? And that sort of takes away your uniqueness yep. uh, as a business model. And I wanted to ask, let's say in a world where all banks have a Triodos business model, how is Triodos going to survive? Yeah, well, um, if that world arises, yeah. then please invite me again and then I will declare <laughs> we have won. Um, but that world is far away from us. Um, having said that, I do welcome all the sustainable initiatives other banks are doing. And I think, by the way, in the Netherlands, we are really one of the front runners. You know, look at what the, the Dutch banks have signed on the climate agreement and how they will now expose themselves by reporting. And the first report will be shown this year. It's quite something. In some neighboring countries, part of Western Europe, you won't see it. So. I am very positive about the steps also my fellow uh, uh, colleagues are, are taking. But having said that, if you look at their balance sheets, if you look at their long-term commitments, they are still in areas and activities which we do not deem sustainable. So I think they have a long way to go. But the reality of life is also um, that yeah, their marketing budgets are way bigger than mine. So um, they will showcase the good things and let's celebrate the good things but they are not close to where we are at this moment. Um, and I think in that sense, uh, there is a long way for us to go, to go. And at the same time, it's also good that um, we financed, I think our first windmill, something in 1985 or 1990. Uh, now it's rather um, uh, yeah, normal business, uh, wind energy and, um, uh, and solar energy it also forces us to innovate and to come up with new uh, things. So this commitment now as one to zero will challenge us to come up with other ways of thinking, of other ways of decarbonizing our um, uh, atmosphere, which we have not thought of, but it will pressure us into innovation. And I think that's what we have to do. We also have to reinvent ourselves to be innovative. And uh, when you think about regenerative uh, activities to restore biodiversity, yeah, it will um, yeah, challenge us to come up with um, yeah, new innovation. So I think that we are way far away from that everything is uh, already good enough, 
but I'm happy to welcome that other banks are moving in the same direction uh, because we all need it as a society and it will push us with our limits even further to still stay ahead of uh, the pack. Well, let's hope that we can bring you back and invite you uh, when you've won, <laughs> when we've had well, all the when banks. When we have won. When know, we have well, won. Because I will not win, we will win as a society because I think we will do it for each other. That's very true. Well, thank you so much for this lovely conversation and thank you so much the audience for joining us. On the 18th of February, we will be talking to European parliamentarian for the Labour Party, Paul Tsang on taxonomy. And if you would like to be on this stage, just like me and Casper, you can now apply to be an interviewer or a marketing officer at Room for Discussion. And let's end on another warm applause for our guest, Jeroen Ruipkema. <laughs> Thank you.